Okay, we should be able to. Attendees are coming in. We had 55 people sign up for this in the end, so. Oh, wow. That's great. I'm going to share my screen. I think they all were supposed to just come right in. I'm going to restart recording. Gloria Sanders is in. Um, Becky, can you go ahead and, and look at the um, Q&A and see if, make sure everything is good? It is good. Uh, Kathy just posted, hello, I'm here. Great. I can't see where the recording starts, so. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm, sh I'm assuming you can hear me. Um, this is our very first remote, remote live and local CEU uh, hosted by AA Spokane. We're excited that all of you joined us. I'm Stephanie Aiden, um, AA Executive Director. And it's our goal is to host at least one of these a month. Um, we have so much great knowledge in the AEC industry um, and we are excited to highlight our local thought leaders and give them the opportunity to connect and educate all of you. Our webinar today is uh, titled CLT, Building Beautiful Communities Through Sustainable Forestry and prefabrication. All of the um, uh, AIA members will receive one credit of HSW and we haven't fully automated that process yet. So if you can go ahead and email me at office at AIA Spokane with your AIA member number, I can cross-reference cross that to your attendance and make sure you get credit. Um, our panelists do want to make this an interactive session and so Q&A is encouraged. There's a Q&A button down below. So go ahead and um, uh, establish your writing your, your questions and to the specific presenter you would like to answer that and our moderator will go ahead and and dish out those as as they she, she as it as they come along so I want to go ahead and present our introduce our presenters we have Craig Crowley who is principal at DCI engineers they are DCI is also an AIA allied partner uh, Vaughan Timbers, Tom Bond, who's a sales manager, and Matthew College, Collins, principal with Uptick Studios. And our moderator today is Becky Blankenship with Hill International. Um, I also want to uh, caution you, since this is our first one, we may have a few technical difficulties. Um, we have people in different locations with different varying bandwidths, so uh, we hope it goes as smooth as, as we would like, uh, but please be patient if it takes a little bit of time to get video and content up. Um, this is the program description. I'm not going to read that, but I will go ahead and just state the learning objectives since this is a course that you're getting credit for. Um, number one, you'll learn to, uh, to understand the importance of forest management. Number two, you, you'll discover um, the opportunities of local forests for, um, for beautiful and specifically in the production of mass timber. And then you'll also understand the steps from moving timber from the forest onto the building sites. And finally, learn about people prefabrication and benefits of utilizing CLT through a local project highlight. So with that, I'd like to kick it off uh, to Tom Bond of um, Boggan Timbers and um, take it away, gentlemen. Tom, I'm going to start here with the video from Russ that you uh, sent us. Correct? Okay. Yes. So, so before you start that, um, thanks everybody. I uh, appreciate everybody joining. Um, we know these are crazy times, but we're excited to be able to get you guys this information, um, even if it's through the Zoom meeting. So hopefully we have a time soon that we can all meet in person. Um, we're going to kick things off because the bandwidth here in, in Colville is the bandwidth here in Colville. So uh, Mr. Collins is going to take care of us and have, a, have about a three minute video here, kind of talks Russ Vaughan, our founder and CEO, um, is going to give a little brief overview, and then we'll get into a, um, um, a PowerPoint that kind of talks about what, what's happening here. So please, Matthew, go ahead. 
So welcome to the Cobble National Forest. This is where it all begins for Blockhouse. We come out here and we find this beautiful forest landscape, but there's more than meets the eye because this forest is not in great health. At least not until we come out here and perform some forest restoration activity as part of the Northeast Washington Forest Coalition. And so we go find places in the forest that are in disrepair and we help the Forest Service develop plans for thinning and it really is forest restoration because we're restoring this forest back to health. It's back to a, a situation where the spacing of the trees is more appropriate for what's naturally here. So when we have wildfires, they burn more predictably, they're less destructive, and we have a forest when it's all said and done. So these trees that are here, the western larch, um, some of the Douglas fir, some of the ponderosa pine, uh, some of the lodgepole pine, when they're packed together, they're not resistant to fire. But when they're separated by a certain spacing, it allows for fire resilience and fire resistance because what happens is the bark is thick enough that when the fire goes along the forest floor, it doesn't kill the tree. And that's what we're trying to do is create healthy forests for generations to come. Once these forests are being restored, it creates the byproduct, which are logs. Typically, that material goes to the local mill, in this case, Bottom Brothers Lumber at Colville. And then once they produce the two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, and in some cases, two by tens, that material can then either go for general construction or it can come to log and timbers just next to the mill. And we can finger glue it together to make long pieces. We use high tech adhesives to put those uh, pieces together into large panels. So we make panels four feet by up to 60 feet long. In the case of Blockhouse, we took those four foot wide panels and we pre designed them as part of the overall design with the architect, Architect Studios and put together this whole package that when we cut it out and took it to the job site and Baker Construction picked it up and put it together, it all slid together perfectly. In, in many cases within a 16th of an inch tolerance. So everything was done uh, really high tech and super clean. It's then insulated and you have this super energy efficient, beautiful wooden home. Then the case of Blockhouse actually ties over to uh, the next door neighbor, Perry Street Brewery, and allows them to uh, put solar panels on the roof to power these homes. They're energy efficient and they're getting renewable energy, and it all comes from the forest here. So we're turning this forest back into its natural resilient self. Uh, we're taking the byproducts from that, and we're turning it into these beautiful structures that people can enjoy. And we think it's the beginning of a trend that we're going to see as we develop our communities uh, into the future. And in this case, we've got two single family lots that are now 14 units in this modular concept that's a total of eight different structures. So you can see it's dense, but there's a lot of uh, separate living. And so we think that that's going to be something very attractive to people that are not only looking for an eco friendly alternative, but to a, a wonderful place uh, to live in a wonderful community. Okay, perfect. So uh, aside from being a, a, a skosh bit um, broken up there, Russ gave us a, a quick uh, overview of, of what we're looking at doing there. So I think it's something very important for everybody to understand that um, one of the big things with Vaughan Timbers is our goal is to um, be able to continue that chapter and actually add a chapter into the, uh, the the book of wood and that was one of the reasons um, Russ got into this business so I'm going to um, here uh, Collins you have this set up I'm going to are you guys able to see my you're probably not able to see my screen at this point are you yes we can see your screensaver it looks like a professional yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I definitely don't want you to see my kids. That's that's my boys there. So uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, trying to trying to make this work, and we did this before. Slideshow. Seeing the spinny dot here. There we go. Okay. So sorry about that. 
Um, so, so Vaughan Timbers um, is a standalone company. A lot of people know uh, Vaughan Brothers Lumber. Um, the story of that uh, started back in the early 1950s. Um, Russ's grandfather um, actually had uh, multiple mills around and um, started with, with some horse-drawn carriages and whatnot. So that came through and um, he grew up in that world. And uh, actually a lot of us here did, which was great. Um, and, and, and this Vaughan uh, at, at one time was kind of the premier um, lumber producer uh, in the area and, and actually in the US. And um, along in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, as we all know, things took a turn. And um, so innovation became very important. Um, from the beginning, even in the 50s, um, Vaughan Brothers Lumber has been big in sustain sustainability. Um, fast forward up into the 90s, um, um, Russ and I actually grew up and graduated together and, and, and forestry and, and sustainable forestry has always been important to them. So he, he saw that, he ran that mill under his, uh, along with his dad um, as a VP and, and he really wanted to bridge the gap with the environmental community uh, as did the, the whole team there. So they started working on, on forestry coalitions and different things to keep the landscape um, in as, as, as natural a state as possible. And so with everything happening, um, there was some, some real issues. A lot of mills across the country shut down um, in our fiber basket, especially even in through Colorado and all of that, that became a real problem in trying to remove that um, and manage those for us and so it came down to the fact of okay we're, it's a zero cut situation so we have to let them go which brought us to where we are you know here in the last few years as we all know um the the, the fires have started coming to be a big big deal and a real dangerous issue and to a to an unhealthy environmental um state and 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 the environmental community is recognizing that so um with some really strong collaboration um we're able to work with Forest Service, um, government agencies, environmental communities, nature conservancies, and, and continue and pull that forward to try and make things healthier. So, so Russ decided here a few years back um, that he wanted to uh, go ahead and write that chapter in the, in the Book of Lumber. Um, so he left Vaughan Brothers Lumber and started Vaughan Timbers. Um, he did some pretty detailed research and, and over in Europe and around and brought to um, our plant here in Colville what he considered to be the best in the world as far as technologies. And so we are the seventh certified um, CLT producing plant, uh, mass timber plant in the Americas. And we received our first certification July, the end of July of 2019. Um, the, the day, the, the Tuesday after Memorial Day of 2018 is when <laughs> everything started being built. So we've moved, um, pretty quickly. Um, it's got us, you know, some stuff. So, so back to that fire, um, problem. So I'm going to pulse to the next slide here. So the era of mega fires has started and, and, and as we are seeing and dealing with that, it is a real problem, not only for the health and safety of people, but definitely for the health and safety of the forests. And so that's where we feel this is a really good fit. We're able to, we, um, we're forced to frame. So we're basically using the downfall or the, the byproduct of a sustainable forest. Um, unfortunately, too many times, this is what we see in a landscape. Uh, this particular picture's from uh, just, just a bit north of us uh, in the Boulder Pass area. Um, this plot of timber in particular where, where the forester Josh is standing there um, was slated to be um, gone through and have some, some management done. Um, but, but you see what happens. Um, these landscapes have way, way, way too many trees on. And, and so what happens is it's just, a, it's just a hotbed for a stage three or a class three forest where when a fire comes through, everything is devastated. Um, with some work with the forest service and the, and the government agencies, um, logging companies or, or, or timber companies are able to come in 
and most of this can be harvested as long as it's acted upon quickly, um, less than a year, uh, most of that is being able to be used. If it, it gets held up, um, then, then it, it, it can't be used and it is truly a waste. And uh, as far as carbon usage and everything else, you know, this is, this is zero. This is actually um, promoting that versus instead of being a carbon sink, um, it is now a carbon producer. So that's where we have um, come, coming back to us that this is kind of the ideal landscape. Um, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, this is what the landscape typically looked like. And so the idea with this is there's, there's enough trees to be sustainable, they take care of themselves. There's the, the, the low, the small trees, all the way up to the big trees. There isn't um, what we call ladder fuels that promote the forest fires. Um, trees are naturally designed to, when a fire comes through, the under storage is burnt, the thick bark protects them, and they're able to sustain that. So, so when we go in and don't do anything with that, then gosh, it gets overrun. Um, it's, I get in trouble from my wife if I don't shave every couple of days because you know that's the same thing as not managing forests. So, so everything um, is, is, is out of balance with that. So the idea what we're trying to get to is to get it to this state so it's healthy, sustainable, um, for our kids and grandkids, we're able to produce from that. So Vaughan Timbers, um, we source our fiber mainly from Vaughan Brothers Lumber, um, which is literally, I'm looking out my window and I can see it. So um, they use, we use everything that's a, a four inch top all the way up to the, the biggest piece is about the size of a steering wheel. So about 12 inch or less. So a lot of times in, in um, um, logging practices that is used as, as pulp or waste. And so we're the Vaughan Brothers Lumber was able to create an opportunity to use all of that, which is where our product comes from. So, so we are excited to be able to do that, take the downfall of this type of landscape and make our cool products with it. Next slide kind of gives an overview. So this crane um, is over at Vaughan Brothers Lumber. Again, if I look out the window, I can see that crane. Um, and this slide kind of depicts the, the circle, right? So it comes into the forest. Typically where we source our fiber from is within about 50 to 60 miles of, of our plant and, and this mill. So it's really great. Um, we have a wonderful relationship with the Forest Service and, and you guys may have heard to the, of the A to Z projects or may not have, but we're able to take um, product and fiber right directly off of uh, our public lands which makes them healthier and um, very sustainable. In fact, Colville National Forest is considered the most sustainable forest in the U.S. per um, the, 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 the Forest Service recollection. So anyway, that's where we are with that. We come in, we get the, the, the fiber and the long links, we take it over to the, to the top right. Um, that is a rough lumber that is stickered drying um, before it goes into the planer and goes through all the process. From there, it comes into our mill, and on the lower left, you'll see uh, this is our plant, our press, um, which is a high-frequency press out of Denmark. Um, we're able to make a, um, a four-foot-wide panel and a four-foot-wide blue lamb bean. Um, it's it's kind of unique. This was the first press like this in the Americas. Um, typically, a, a layup process is anywhere from four hours to 24 hours. We're able to, to press and cure um, a three, three ply 60 foot panel in less than uh, 20 minutes, about 18 minutes. So it's pretty awesome. Um, we love the technology, it's been really great. Uh, on the lower right is a glue lamb beam headed in, um, into the CNC to be, to be cut and fabricated um, for a project. So I'm gonna go ahead and pulse it forward to the next slide. This is one of the things that you get with, with, um, with mass timber and CLT. Um, you get basically a, a very specific um, set of parts. Um, we call them the Legos. So you have a very detailed set of Legos. We're able to go in and do specific shop drawings for each part, but also for the layout of the entire project. Um, this is a project that is local to Colville that we just recently um, worked with um, with a, a group HDG and and um, Craig and DCI and his group and and so we were able to set this out. The the top uh, left slide is is the the zones. So they were they were set up. So as the trucks are being loaded, 
they're loaded specifically for each zone. So as a builder, um, as a contractor, as boots on the ground, you're able to get that in a very specific, efficient manner. Um, all the detailing is done ahead of time. So essentially the last piece on the truck is the first piece off. Um, this particular project uh, was a 20,000 square foot footprint. Um, we did the beam structure as well as the, the roof lid um, that is CLT. Um, this project was set and completed in about four days. Uh, you take a few hours out of that plus or minus. Um, the erector was a, a steel erector by trade. It was his first time setting a CLT project. He'd never done it before. And he, as everyone was, were very ecstatic about how everything went. Um, I asked him how many of these beams could he set if they had to do all the fabrication on site. And he said maybe three to four a day. Um, however, this project was completed and ready to go for the roof deck on top of that project in a very short time. So, so as you guys are designing things and making these projects, you, you're very helpful in this process because we're able to do this stuff up front. So essentially when it hits the ground, there's really no sawdust on site. Um, so that's why it's so important to have that collaboration with um, us and, 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 and you guys so we know what's going on right from the beginning and we can pulse that ahead. So um, I'll skip to the next slide. So here's some examples. Um, one of the things that we found has become essential and, and in this, in the projects we've done thus far that we've done the fabrication and hardware assembly for, it's been huge time savings. Uh, right now, the projects that we've tracked with the contractors, um, it's about a 50% time savings, um, sometimes more. Um, cost savings is, is well over a 50, what, or a 50%. Um, time savings is sometimes more than that 50%. So um, here's an example of how this would come out. Um, the project on the left, um, that's all detailed parts that go out as they're loaded onto the truck. Um, the, the truck driver is given a book or the, the, uh, the, the GC is given a book. So as they arrive, those parts are uh, marked uh, specifically on the, on the paper so they know exactly where to go. Uh, the middle process or middle picture here is um, uh, an example of beams that were done for a project. Um, they were sent to us, uh, or all of the fittings and hardware were sent to us so we could pre-fit it and make sure everything works. Um, and in some cases, like the slide on the right, um, that's all pre-attached. And ideally, when they come off the truck, they unwrap them and set them into place. And so um, it has been a, a really great opportunity for us. Um, we've worked with some, some great partners and, and they say that this is such a, a huge help to them. So, so ideally, um, to, to make that process work best, everything's done at the factory as much as um, reasonable, as much as a contractor wants us to do. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. So another thing that we're able to do, and this is from that job up here in Colville that we did, um, we were able to, to put a finishing coat uh, on there and um, essentially a lot of the CLT that, that you, know, you guys are designing with, you're looking at the pictures and whatnot and you're seeing a, um, a European white look. So because of their spruce, um, the, typically that, that European spruce that they build with is a very white clean wood. Um, we, we actually can offer an SPF Product. I'll get to that in a minute, which is a similar product. But um, all of these panels are a Doug Fir Larch product, and this is a Sanson stain on there to cover up. Um, the the customer wanted a uh, whitewashed look, and so we we're able to add it. It's called a pickle white stain. It's this is a three coat system. Um, they go on there. Um, then as they're loaded, they're turned over because the finished side goes down. Um, all of the bunks are carpeted. Um, the finished site is down, sanded, clean, ready to go on site. So, so that again has been a great uh, opportunity for us to have offerings for our customers that really helps them out to um, pulse those projects and give Mass Timber really the, you know, kind of that shining star that, that everybody expects from it. This is a, um, a shop drawing. So, so when we do a project, um, we do a, it's, it's almost a nesting program 
not only for the panels and the beams for fabrication, but also for the loading of the trucks. So very specific detail is put into this. So the, the, the contractors and the, the, the folks, the boots on the ground, they are ready to go and know exactly what they're getting in that load. So our loadout crew, our, our back end crew is fabulous. Um, the first project we did, this was a collaboration with Swinerton for a Hillsborough Community Center, 300 and some beams they brought in and, and were given to us and we fabricated them, put them on there um, out of the 300 and some beams. I think that there was three or four that were actually south facing instead of north facing, you know, little things like that. So um, yeah, we're, we're not perfect, but we're sure trying hard. And, and once they got them, they decided that they really liked that process. So that's just an example of, of the, how that can work. Um, our next picture, this actually is a, um, this is at the factory. Uh, this was a load that went, the, this project went to Finland of all places. Um, I, I won't go into the details on how it got to, to Finland, but um, they're a, they're a um, uh, they produce sawmill equipment. And the one just on, from Boggan Brothers Lumber is, it's called Hewsaw. It's the most um, productive Hewsaw uh, in the world. And they wanted some product from that. So they can, we containerized this product and it went over to a, um, a really cool an internal office inside an office. So it's a, a climate controlled office that's set inside an existing building um, that they put their office cubicles in. So anyway, but the hey, delivery, Tom, what, yes, go ahead. We've got a question I'll kind of throw in there. We kind of wanted to make sure people can do this interactively. So I'm gonna throw out sure. that for you. So Kirk is asking, are representatives of the client, for example, representatives of the design team providing any uh, quality assurance at the fabrication facility as far as so so let me let me i'll try and explain that and please make sure that that answers your question so basically once we get a signed off on finalized shop drawings um, that have been approved by the architects or the customer whoever whoever that chain of um, command is then then we would proceed from there every piece um, that comes out not only goes through a very strict quality control process because for delamination and everything else, it has to have their specific APA testing requirements that it goes through, um, but it also, the operators uh, verify every piece and put it on a file um, or put it on file for, for every project. So yes, there's a very strict quality control. As far as a um, person being on site from the project, um, we have not had that yet. However, I'm totally open to that. Um, we, we can do whatever whatever makes you feel comfortable with that. Does that does that answer your question? Hey Tom, this is Craig. I just add a little bit to that. From the shop drawing process is unique um, for wood products compared to what we see in other examples of utilizing wood products, such that you see a 3D view of each piece um, down to the the CNC routering of bolt holes and connections, exact dimensions of everything. So there's a pretty easy way for the design team and the owner's representatives to have a good ability to comment uh, prior to fabrication. Perfect, thank you, Craig. Um, hopefully that kind of covers that. Yeah, our, our tolerances are a 16th of an inch and most times um, the design teams with our request We'll, we'll add an additional 16th of an inch, um, so an eighth inch tolerance total. Um, and, and, and sometimes you need that because that's all you're getting. <laughs> and so um, those are very specific to those projects. So um, then I'll, I'll go ahead, Becky, if, if, we're, if we're good there, if you checked off on that, I'll continue on. Yep, good to go. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next slide here. I'm uh, making sure I have enough time for everybody. Um, so this is a project, so, so we talked, Russ talked about, we, I've talked about collaboration. Um, we don't expect that you make everything that you do into CLT and Blue Lamb beams. We really like collaboration. Um, we love steel, we love concrete, um, we love framing, it all works together, right? So, so and this, this is a, a Swinerton project that I just wanted to show is kind of a um, collaboration on, on how this took place. Um, but, but one of the things, and, and, and on the architectural side, 
I'll explain it. This is more of an engineering piece that we, we highlighted with this slide. But um, so you can see these are these are um, single story columns um, versus a multi story column. But when you do the single stories, um, you can you can brace per level per layer. So when you're done with that first floor, you can move to the second floor and you can brace it specifically for that floor without having to wait. So, so that first floor can be dried in at this point and moving forward. All your MEPs, your subs can be going from there. So that just kind of highlights the speed in which this can happen. Um, so, and, and this is a project where a, a, a glue lamb attached to a column covered up with a lid of, or a floor of CLT. Um, it's just really a great, plus you've got your steel structure in there. Um, so this is a good example of collaboration and uh, also just you know showing you the different options as far as your your floor to floor columns versus multi span columns so okay so we're going to go to the next one um, this is just some just kind of a a quick showing of of what else can be done out there this is the cnc machine uh, I, I guess the cnc guys can draw cool stuff up and so therefore they can make a cool desk where they do their work from so so they have kind of like the king's chair built now, which looks like a big throne. I don't know where they get the time to do that, but I guess they do it. So, um, uh, so, so the, the left-hand slide, obviously, that's our CNC workstation. Um, the right-hand side, the top panel, that's a, um, a Douglas fir large uh, three-ply CLT panel. Um, it's a V1 panel. Um, the, the, so it's just a showing, showing what that is. Um, the, the, the bottom left, or the bottom right slide is a um, really fun project we did. Um, Twist Works. Um, they 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 are a, a learning center. Um, they've got a really cool campus. This is an acoustical panel um, that that was done for a sound stage that they have up there. And so you can see we can get pretty detailed with our CNC work um, as long as we have the the information to support that. We can go through and basically do whatever you need us to do so just a just a brief showing of the offerings I'm gonna go ahead and jump to the next slide um, won't spend a lot of time on this but again back to our collaboration piece um, we worked with uh, Swinnerton on another project this was actually we, we the, the idea behind this is they had a project uh, Oregon State University is building um, trying to build a campus out of mass timber and so we get to be uh, involved with the very first building on that and they required an E-rated panel. Um, and, and so we were able to go out and have a, uh, get a certification through PFS Tico on an E-rated panel. And um, the point of this is we, we now have offerings, we've been in testing and, and um, to, to, to basically those offerings can compete with any manufacturer out there. Where we differ is that we're willing to to work with each customer so so basically if we have a customer that says hey this is what we need are you able to do that we don't just say no nope, this is what we have take it or leave it where we can go out and say yeah you know what we can do that and within a real short window um, as long as everything is lined out we can get that certification for a specific project um, if needed if one of our um, pre pre um, certified products doesn't work. So um, that was the point of this slide, uh, to be able to work with our customers. That's, that's a biggie for us. So go to the next one. Um, these are some pipeline products. Now, now um, Craig, this is his world. Uh, boy, this, these are, you know, I'm a sales guy. So numbers are numbers to me. But um, bottom line is we have a lot of offerings coming up. I spoke earlier to an SPF offering we just sent out 55 test panels to PFS Tico to start their testing process on. So we're able to have a Doug Fur line um, and, and then also we're able to have an SPF line. And so this is just our span tables and our E ratings and, and the things that, that you guys really need for designing um, these projects. And, and obviously we can work through individually what these all mean. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on that. You guys can reach out to me, I can get these to you. So here in the next six months, we hope to have these, these uh, offerings covered. So that's our goal as of right now. Um, here's an example of a, an SPF versus a DFL. So the, S, the SPF is a spruce pine fir. 
Um, honestly, in our fiber basket, a lot of that's going to be a lodge pole. So it is a whiter, lighter wood. Um, there are going to be some potential for some blues in there, um, some of the reds. Um, you're getting a little more of that yellow look with the SPF. Um, the DFL is a really rich, um, it's got the red and the brown tones along with some of the lighter tones. Uh, in Europe, a, a DFL is used almost like an ornamental cedar, like we would use it here, um, because they, they have a lot of white wood that's just a plain open white wood without as many characteristics as the DFL. So, so those are um, some different offerings that we have there. Um, here's some close-ups of some unfinished samples. Um, so, so both of these are an SPF. Um, they're a three-ply CLT. Uh, we cut some samples out of there so you can see the difference. Um, you know, you, to, to pull the blue out of that is, is, uh, can be done. It is um, an architectural grade, uh, uh, industrial grade versus architectural. It's really not going to ma matter on strength wise. It's all visual is the difference there. So um, a couple of the ladies in the plant that are uh, cutting these samples, getting them ready to go. Um, this slide, now. <laughs> Some people would say, why in the world would you uh, have, a, have a, a Katera building in here there? Because one, because it's a super cool building, and two, because we think that mass timber is, is awesome. And, and the fact that we have two plants within you know, 70 miles of each other is great. So this is um, a building that probably a lot of you on this presentation have either been through or, or, or are going to look at. Um, it's a catalyst building. Um, and actually, one of the other reasons I have this slide in there is because Luke Dimbeck, who's now on our team, um, he sourced all the material for this. He, he, in a previous life, worked for Katera, had a great um, experience with those guys, and he, he uh, procured a lot of the stuff for this. So um, he is on our team now, and, and, and it's been really positive for us to have that hands-on experience uh, on our team. Um, but again, it's about collaboration and also a look. This is one of the first buildings, mass timber buildings that I'm aware of and Luke's aware of and Russ is aware of that if you look at the beams and the CLT, they're actually all um, matched. So they specifically, they get their, their lumber from Canada, so Canfor. So they work with a, a group called Western Arch Rib and had beams specifically designed with the same material um, as the CLT. So. So that's something cool that they did. It's, it's something that we uh, really looked at and we're able to offer the same a matching beam along with the CLP as well. But uh, anyway, really cool project. Um, this is a, I'm, I'm, I'm working through these fairly quickly here just because I want to give our, the rest of our team a, some time. So if you have questions, let me know. This is an example of, um, this is a Swinerton job that, that um, we, we provided the, the beams for. You can see on the ends, that's the Rikons. Um, they've got like 30 some screws. I'd have to count them exactly depending on the size. But this is the level of precision that you get when everything is prefabricated ahead of time. So literally to do that on site, you can imagine all the things that can go wrong there versus having it done when it gets off of the truck and is plopped into place and that pick takes three minutes versus you know three hours. So um, really cool stuff there. Um, again, collaboration, we were able to work with these guys. They took someone else's beams. Uh, we were, did not have the certification for that size of beams. Brought them up here from Oregon. Um, we fabricated them and sent them back down there. So it worked out really well for the customer and they're gorgeous. It's a Hillsborough Community Center. Um, this next slide is, is a Hillsborough Community Center on the end. Um, this is something that, that this was our first introduction to working with Swinerton and really broadened our minds on the fabrication piece of things. Um, again, you know, to be able to, to set that off, there was a huge time savings, um, a huge cost savings um, for everyone involved there. So I'll jump to the next slide. <laughs> this is Sydney. She's a, a Swinerton employee. And I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, like toot Swinerton's horn, you guys, but it's just something that we've had a good relationship with those guys and have worked on quite a few projects for. There's a lot more to this picture than Sydney getting a nice picture, right? Um, there, there's the beams in the back. Um, everything is prefabricated. We sent those down. So the columns and the beams. Um, and again, the idea of uh, not a lot of manpower needed to set this stuff. 
Um, so, so they were able to do this with a real small crew. They set that in, a, in an inclement weather situation. Everything went quick and fast and they were able to move through that and get it dried in in a very quick manner. So um, we come to this and this is kind of one of our highlights. A lot of you have seen the project. Um, uh, Matthew and, and Craig are very, very uh, much involved in all this. This is a blockhouse project. This was kind of our first go at everything. These were panelized. They were on a truck. Each building was delivered on a truck um, in a package. And um, so they are able to go on there. And, and man, it's, it's been such a fun project. The idea of this really highlights um, what CLT and mass timber is meant to do. Um, that forest to frame is brought out here. And uh, Matthew will give us a little overview of that and, and Craig on that. But um, what a fun design. It was able to go up. You know, some of this stuff, this was the first time out of the gate for, for um, air, all parties involved. So I think in the end, it was really exciting to see that that worked uh, the way it did. So I'll jump through that. This is a project up on Gaza Ranch. Um, roof panel guy had never worked with CLT before. Comes December and he says, I don't know how I'm going to get this roof built 57 feet up in the air. Uh, in the middle of December, my crew's going to fall off of there never used CLT, said, let's try it. I think there were 57 foot panels. Um, first time out of the gate, he had a small uh, crane. He set them up there in about four hours and his roof deck was done and, and he was madly in love with CLT after that. So um, on a steel frame, you know, really cool project here. So, so a couple, last couple slides here. Um, this, is a, this is a project that was done, these stair treads, it's on the OSU campus. There's 150 of these. We just got some 3D drawings or a 3D walkthrough virtual pictures this morning of it. Uh, unbelievable. It's a spiral staircase. Um, there's four flights and they go clockwise and counterclockwise. So this was something that we fabricated, put all of the treads on, um, finished, um, did the CNC work. So pretty exciting project. I did have a few nightmare, uh, cold sweat, wake up in the middle of the night when somebody would say stair treads. So um, those were, but in the end, it's been a great project. On the right-hand side there, um, that's, uh, that's some, some stuff coming right out of the, the press going onto the CNC. Those are 60-foot panels. Um, and so, you know, we're able to, to get those things etched out and ready to go. Here's some examples. Uh, um, two of these are the, the community center uh, or, or uh, uh, the, the OSU campus. So this is the first building of hopefully many. Um, it sounds like we've got a pretty good relationship there and would uh, are excited to be a part of all of that project. Um, we've got some apartment complex projects in the works and, and so things are, things are starting to get rolling and people are really seeing the benefits of mass timber and CLT. Um, that may bring, brings me to the end. I, I tried to go through that fairly quickly. Um, biggest thing for us is we're really excited about what we do. You know, we have a little bit different story than everybody else with the sustainable piece. I mean, we're, 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 we're lumber folks that care about our community. Russ and I grew up here along with many of members of our team. And so it's more than just about, you know, starting a business and doing some of that. It's about contributing, giving back, and making sure our kids and grandkids are around to see these uh, sustainable projects and be involved with them like we are. So um, thank, thank you very much. We're going to pass it over to, I, I think, um, Craig, are you going next, or Matthew, are you going next? Uh, Matthew's going to jump up first. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Howdy, y'all. Uh, I'm Matthew Collins, Principal Architect at Uptick Studios. Um, I thought I'd start by just showing you a quick uh, rendered video of Blockhouse so that you can get oriented to the overall project and then we'll dive into the details. Sorry, I don't have a soundtrack on this one. Uh, 
All righty. So uh, Blockhouse Life is the name of uh, the company we formed um, to uh, investigate um, sustainable uh, solutions for our residential uh, challenges in the US. Um, right out of the gate, we recognize that this is a, a, a challenge far bigger than us and um, work to build relationships with like-minded people um, that wanted to explore the idea of sustainable building for residential projects. Um, and we had a, a lot of great partners that we worked on through this whole process. Um, but in, the reason we're doing this is uh, we all know that we got some really uh, significant problems in our country related to housing. Um, and we wanted to be a part of the conversation and to work uh, with like-minded individuals to uh, start developing solutions. Um, and these are, these are, you know, what is Blockhouse? Uh, these are some of our credos as we, um, begin, we begin to look at uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, sustainable, adaptable, affordable methods. Uh, I think a big piece of that is uh, that we're developing communities, not just um, four walls and a roof but it's really uh, how do these uh, stitch back into our communities. So uh, as we work through the problem, we develop, we, uh, I guess, uh, highlighted three uh, major uh, points of how we're gonna um, tackle this uh, with uh, kit of parts um, so that we're using the same repetitive system over and over again. Um, we recognized that they needed to be uh, built offsite. Uh, and then we look at a peer system to minimize uh, the disruption to the existing site. As we began to explore these, these ideas, uh, CLT immediately came to the forefront as the uh, appropriate building system uh, for this project. Um, because it had all the touch points we were looking for. Um, it's sustainable. It's based around a circular economy within our region. Um, it's customizable. It's lightweight. Uh, it's affordable compared to other systems. Um, and the, the amount of time and labor saved by being able to utilize CLT as an offsite uh, palletized or flat packaged uh, delivery system. Um, so looking at the blocks themselves, you know, because we're using uh, CLT, we have very low energy consumption. Um, we're a, we, uh, we did not go after certification for passive house or net zero, but these buildings just off the shelf are hitting all of that criteria. Um, and we're able to create a very, you know, low impact uh, community uh, residential neighborhood. So the, the community aspect uh, extended beyond just the, the block houses themselves, uh, where we have uh, shared community assets, such as Tom mentioned, the uh, solar panels that we're sharing with Perry Street Brewery. We also have on site a uh, container um, for, now I'm totally uh, blanking on the name, um, Link Foods, I'm sorry. Uh, Link Foods is, is a farm to table uh, delivery system. So we're able to bring fresh produce and meats to this uh, community and then a line bike juicer. So we're able to provide uh, a variety of transportation uh, systems. We also provided some other amenities like a carpooling shelter, um, community gardens and uh, some other uh, public space that we can, you know, once uh, 
the pandemic loosens up a bit, we get back to farmer's market and whatnot, we wanted to make sure we're providing that for the community. So Blockhouse on Perry was definitely looked at as a prototype. Um, like Tom said, this was our first one out of the gate. It was a steep learning curve, both to build a high density residential community within a, a tight uh, suburban footprint, as well as the uh, challenges involved in getting up to speed with how to best utilize CLT. Um, you can see here uh, with the design, we developed as part of our kit of parts, uh, three different layouts. So we have a, a really small um, 12 by 20 unit, uh, which is our studio un unit, which is gonna be uh, part of a short-term rental um, project. And then we have uh, one bedrooms and three bedrooms. Uh, these are 12 by 40. Um, part of the, the block and the flexibility of the block was so that we could orient our uh, site around a lot of the existing trees um, and with our peer system we're, we're able to do that without disrupting the root balls and preserve those old growth canopies. Um, that, that pretty much wraps up what I had to say about the project. I'd be happy to answer any further questions. Um, I'm now going to play a video if I can find it. Uh, this is a quick uh, reel that um, Baker Construction put together on some of the activities on the site. And then I think we'll be rolling into uh, Craig's presentation. All right, thank you, Matthew. I'll grab the screen here if I can. Please do. All right. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit. One of the things Matthew uh, mentioned there at the end is the module. Um, Blockhouse was originally conceived and brainstormed to be something that could be modular. Um, the beta version, um, there was a lot of obstacles to making it fully modular, but we were with the design charged with trying to come up with a concept that could be modular. And after lots of different iterations and brainstorming sessions, what we came up with was a steel frame at the base supported on piers to make as little site impact as possible. And the base frame makes it pretty easy for picking and handling from a shipping perspective. Um, infilled with framing at the floor. And we looked at slab on grade, we looked at concrete stem walls, uh, CLT base, framed base. Ultimately, we chose a frame base for a place to conceal some of the piping penetrations, electrical in the base and provide an opportunity for insulation. Um, that may change in future iter iterations, but I'm just gonna walk through a few of the construction photos to give an idea of how this all came together. So. On the left, you see the pier foundations and the steel base frame. You'll notice in some of these pictures, because each module was shipped individually, um, the panels for each module, um, we have construction at all different stages out on site at the same time. So on the right-hand side, you see in the background, almost a finished unit, um, one that just has panels and wrap on it, and then the framed base of the next unit. So it starts with um, on-site work. Um, some of that activity that goes on, um, the concrete piers being poured, the frame being set, that base framing at the same time, panels are being fabricated in the shop, which ultimately get delivered on a truck unit by unit, and those panels get flown into place. 
Um, the Vaughan panels, one of the things that's unique about them being four feet wide, where some of the manufacturers would be more 10 feet or 12 feet or eight feet wide, um, where you would do a punched type concept and those punched openings um, get discarded. And sometimes reused for other applications, but mostly discarded. And with the four foot panels, it uh, provides an opportunity for a little greater efficiency because the spandrels and the head beams and the sill beams um, are individual panels that get placed in. So it's such that there's no, there's no panel that gets cut out of the middle and discarded. So you can see some wall pier panels, a spandrel beam panel being set, uh, pretty small crew, one guy handling it, one guy on the crane, one guy kind of guiding from the base pretty easy bracing in the form of just some two by fours and two by sixes in place. Um, you can catch a sneak peek of the smart wall that's here, which I'll get into with another slide here in a minute. Uh, bracing gets put in place. You can see kind of a two story version with a bit more bracing in place, just some pipe braces and other things that get set. These wall panels are pretty stable because of how they all go together in the splines. You can see some weather, weather protection going on for um, some future panels that are being stored. Um, and then um, stitching everything together. And there's all kinds of hardware that's being developed out there by multiple different companies. A lot of them are out of Europe, but now have distribution in the United States. And then companies like Simpson are coming up with their version of everything. But Here's a few different versions that we used on the blockhouse project for stitching panels together. In the upper right here, we're just using a plywood spline. And this often is on the outside. Yes. Can I throw in a question for you real quick? Absolutely. All right, um, Anonymous has asked, how did the construction cost for blockhouse using CLT compared to building with conventional wood frame? Well, I don't have all of the costs, but I know it was a bit of a premium given the beta version. And, and that was something that the developers of this particular project were prepared for. Um, they feel like there's some other offsets in um, minimizing finishes and then um, future versions of this that become modular. The hope is that the speed of construction and the precision and uh, repetitive nature of doing something time and time again offsets um, some of the costs, um, some of the premium costs for there's, at the end of the day, there's more wood fiber in a CLT project as opposed to a framed project. But the idea is, is if you can get a better product for near or same price, uh, you know, the value is greater. Well, one thing to, that. Craig, if, if you don't mind, if I add to that just a skosh is, there's some, some rough numbers trying to come in out there, but somewhere between that 18 to 32% is kind of a cost savings. You, you, you have to look at it differently than most times we look at it now. And that is, do you want cheaper products, you know, a, a lower cost product, if that's what you're bidding versus a lower cost building. Um, so to look at that, like you said, you know, this one's probably gonna be at a premium, um, but, but in, a, in a lot of applications, depending on the size, um, your time savings, all that has to be factored in. So the initial materials are typically, depending, could be potentially more, but your overall savings um, and your project um, is typically a little bit less, if that gives kind of a brief description. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And um, there's lots of comparisons being made out there with CLT and where it is really easy to compare costs is to other plank type systems like precast concrete or concrete over metal deck, those sorts of systems. Um, when you're comparing it with traditional stick framing, um, you know, sometimes there needs to be some other advantages that you capture just because the material, the wood fiber is a little bit more, but um, has opportunities for cost savings and certainly a premium product at the end of the day. So again, back to kind of the joints, there's lots of different opportunities. There's overlapping joints, which is what we use when we wanted to make the attachment from one side only, where we had some back-to-back -back walls and so there was limited access to the outside. Um, and most of the places we use the spline connection, which is just a three quarter or inch and an eighth plywood with screws each side, which is what you can see here. In this case, it was on the exterior in most locations um, so that it was concealed by the insulation. 
and siding. But sometimes if you do this, because it comes through and can have a nice finished piece as opposed to plywood and with the CNC and the drilling and everything that is um, available for making this a precise connection, it can be something that is architectural and done on the inside as well, particularly if the panels want to be pre-sided um, in the factory. So we designed this in, in many ways such that it could be done in the factory but on this first round, um, most of this activity was done in the field with a few exceptions other than the prefabrication of the panels themselves and then the smart wall. Um, we had a few other uh, variations of connections in this case for the areas that had roof decks or a second story. Um, we wanted to balloon frame the walls, so we actually just used a steel ledger that gets screwed in and kind of a nice look to capture that. On the lower right is another um, really simple method, basically a couple toenails. You screw in the floor panel to the panel below and then just toenail in the base of the wall up above. So pretty easy to put into place and goes really fast. And here's the smart wall where a lot of the plumbing, um, it was done ahead of time in the shop and these panels were built, uh, trucked out a couple at a time and then put into place such that uh, those connections all just married up with what was out in the field and saved a lot of the on-site effort. And then of course, insulation went on. One of the key things is to think about the breathability of CLT if you are concealing it. In this case, uh, rock wool was used for the insulation. Um, and then a reclaimed wood was um, used for kind of the accent pieces of the siding. Um, so you can have a lot of fun with that and it all went together pretty easily. Um, what you do with piping conduit is also something uh, to be thought through. There's a lot of different options with the CNC. Uh, the boxes can be cut out such that they're recessed with the wiring going on the exterior, either routed into the panel or running through the insulation gap um, or you can use face mounted conduit. And in this project, it kind of had a combination of both um, for different circumstances, depending on how that was run. And then we're just kind of getting on a few of the units to the finish and it's really nice space um, with all that exposed wood. Um, it's very beautiful, it's, uh, was used for the stair treads and um, it's gonna provide some really nice finished space. So uh, just a few minutes over, um, but that brings us to the end of it. We appreciate everybody's time. And if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Nothing so far. Either we answered them all or everybody's asleep. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got to thank you. So somebody's awake, so. <laughs> what, what, what I want to say just a quick thing and, and to to Matthew and Craig especially I mean you guys have rocked all of this stuff the blockhouse stuff but thanks for helping putting this together and, and thanks Stephanie for allowing us to do this um, if there's something that somebody needs on a on a one-on-one -on -one basis or they want to have us come down obviously with everything going on whatever you feel comfortable with but as far as Vog and Timbers go let me know reach out to me and uh, we can help if we need samples, presentations, whatever. We're more than happy to do that. Okay, the questions are rolling in, so don't leave, guys. Okay. So, uh, Marion asked, is there a catalog of those details on the electrical? Um, I, I'm not aware of a specific catalog for the electrical details, although there may be one out there. Um, the CLT manual, which is a free download, and it's a massive 550 page manual uh, that can be downloaded it has all kinds of things with the fabrication design fire protection weather protection um, electrical um, so that's one resource that's out there and Tom I I mean maybe you have a catalog of just different details or things that have been done I'm not sure I, I'll be honest um, we don't have anything specifically but but there's a really good resource um, woodworks.com. I'm not trying to plug those guys, but they are a invaluable resource free of charge that you, their website is loaded with presentations, options. Um, they will actually come and help 
um, you with a project to figure out how to make um, wood and mass timber work for your project. So there is some information on there, but woodworks.com uh, has, has a, a ton of information as well. All right, uh, next question. How do you verify compliance with fire rating requirements? Uh, I, guess, I guess I could start with that. Um, uh, as Blockhouse was the first one out of the ground, um, we permitted everything through the building department as a conventional building. So we went through the same inspection process that you would if it was a stick framed uh, building. As we look forward, um, we may be permitting these at the state level so we can get that certification um, prior to uh, submitting for permit so that we won't need that inspection process. The, the PRG 320 has specifics in there that um, talk about um, the, the, the different fire ratings for the different plies. Um, there's some, some stuff that we've done where they've added um, layers, you know, your rock layers, one and two layers, but PRG 320 is a real good guide, generalized guide to help with that. Um, and then more specifically, you know, we can get into details on a specific project. Um, so, so, you know, we, we're a resource for that. Um, if not, we, we have opportunities through the different agencies to help with that. All right, uh, John Eckert says, looking forward to seeing it in the future. Cool project. Sheila says, this was an interesting presentation and seeing the various building types with CLT construction. Thanks. Uh, terrific presentation from Kirk Pawski. Well done, guys. And then uh, James asks, what about bugs damaging the wood? <laughs> well, um, I, I would, I mean, you guys follow up with this, Craig and Matthew, but Basically, you know, it's, it's, it is wood um, that can happen. Um, typically, it's enveloped in a manner um, that protects it. Um, I would say it's no more susceptible to a bug infestation than a, than a framed uh, type situation. It's something that, that being a solid panel, a lot of times, you know, you don't have the access in there. But, but I, I don't think it's, it's any worse than a, a, a typical wood application and might even be enhanced a little bit just because it is a solid frame. Yeah, Tom, I, I mean, I, it is wood and there is some level of susceptibility um, to other things that wood is susceptible to, but um, in terms of, of bug and exposure and, and weather, the thing that it has going for it is a lot of repetition most of the time and less surface area per volume of wood as opposed to a bunch of two by six studs, for instance, where bugs could be eating away at the perimeter of it from all directions. Um, but still, still something to be thought through. Yeah. The follow up on that question was you showed a building raised above the ground, is it closed off? So I think you kind of addressed that. So. Yeah, and I think Matthew or I could both talk about that, but we went through a lot of different variations of what that might look like from a, a, a skirt more or less that comes in after the fact uh, it's a closed off uh, crawl space or something that ultimately could just be raised above the ground. And for ultimate flexibility and placement and minimal site disturbance, um, it's closed off for the most part, but obviously it has communication with, you know, utilities and those sorts of things um, down through the base. Okay, that's, that's all the questions I see here so far. There's still 48 participants. Anyone got anything? <laughs> I will say that I will say that they're hiding steel connections in the wood to protect them for fire rating. So that's uh, if they can hide steel in there, I would think that maybe it'd hold a bug or two out. Okay, I'm I'm not seeing anything else. It doesn't look like anybody has any more questions. For those who didn't see it on the on the chat, Stephanie reminded you that uh, if you need credit for the course, email your AIA number to her at office at aiaspokane.org. And I just want to thank, first of all, this is our first live um, 
continuing education webinar that we pr helped produce. And so I just want to thank the 55 of you that logged in and participated. Um, that was just a great showing, and especially to our panelists, Craig, uh, Tom, and Matthew. Thank you for joining us and Becky for moderating. So um, more to come, and um, this was a great start. So thank you so much. Th thanks, everybody. Yeah. We appreciate thank you. it. Have a great day. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.